to California. Seen the sights and people there. Today's video is coming to you from Kodiak, Alaska, where they like heat, light, and power. <laughs> Well, actually, today we are going to be talking about power. Power, power, power. We all need lots of power. And, well, we have our Rad Power e-bikes. We both have the city. Grace's model has the step-through. And, um, yeah, there are batteries. And um, they'll go for about four to six hours, maybe um, up to about maybe, oh, I don't know, about 30 to 50 miles, depending upon what pedal assist level you're looking for. But um, how are you going to charge them when you're out on the road? That's what today's video is about. So what we're going to do is get um, an inverter. Now I know a lot of you out there in the RV community that use them a lot, you get solar. You go ahead and have that charge up. You know, have uh, maybe about four panels, get three, 400 watts per hour, maybe about four hours a day when the weather is good. Um, and that's nice. That's a great way to go. But um, when you start to get in the bigger inverters, if you're not going to be using them a lot, it starts to add up. The Magnum Power is certainly a good company that's out there. But um, for something like this that's just going to use it intermittently, yeah, some days we'll be at the RV parks and we'll have access to power there. But those days where, uh, I'm not saying we're going to stay at Walmart Shopping Center every day, but there will be times where probably we're not going to be having access to power. Some of the Elks Clubs, that, for instance, they have power, some of them may not. So, what are we going to do? Well, um, the solution I'm going to go for is to get a um, 2 kilowatt inverter. This one is made by Ames Power System. They're about $300 for a, um, a 2K. I would recommend that you get a pure sign, not a rectangular sort of sine wave, which um, you know some of the cheaper ones are. You want it so that when you hook up your laptop or other appliances, that they're going to get a nice continuous signal that's going to be running your um, modern electronics. Well, okay, so how does it work? Well, it uses 12 volts in, and the output is um, 110 volts. And um, if you have up to 200 amps, voltage times the amps equals uh, 2,000. So, and then get a surge for a little bit more, but don't run that very long. That might be if you were starting up some kind of appliance or something. So, well, how are we gonna do that? Well. Um, we got to get power from somewhere, and one way is we can go um, try to get it somewhere in the cab here. Um, and where do we have um, the battery? Well, the battery isn't here. Now, there is um, an access when I'm using the um, a compressor with an alligator clip. It takes more than a cigarette lighter. You know, there's um, access to 12-volt power there, and you can get a ground anywhere. But what we're going to do is we're going to, um, I think... Obviously, we want to put this in the cab. Well, maybe it's not obvious, but um, the idea is what we want to do is have it where it stays cooler. If you had it under the hood, it's going to be pretty hot. So under here on my RV is where the access panel is. And once we get this out of the way, you can see, voila, there is the battery. And so um, this battery here has you know the negative over on this side, and here's where all the positives are. In fact, one of those positives goes um, out to the front where I showed you that strip where we have access for compressors or other things we need power. But we have a couple things going here. I mean, obviously, one of it has to go back to the engine to the alternator, <laughs> right, to keep this thing charged. And then additionally, we have something that goes back to the coach going back this way where we have um, a circuit breaker back up there at the top and that distributes to all of our 12 volt power. Okay, so if we're going to have 110 volt power, I think what we'll do is we'll be putting it, um, don't judge me too harshly, but I think I'm going to try putting it right about here. And um, that'll still give us room to kind of step through there. Um, yeah, you'd like it to be under a seat or something like that, but I don't have that much space here. And um, so the 110 volts will come out, oops, on the other side here. There's two outlets for 110 volts, or 120 if you will, and um, the input, the 12 volts DC is going to be coming from here, going through a cable that's going to look like this. That's huge. There's my little pinky finger. This is a 4-aught cable 
for what that's worth. So um, you can see it's got a lot of copper in there. Um, just, I think it was about a $50 or so cable for five feet. It's um, got a lot of copper. Copper does cost money. So um, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to put a, a lug over here. It's going to have to be crimped. I have a crimping tool I purchased and a cutting tool. There's always more so that we need to get these things going. We're going to come out with a short power cable. We're going to stop right about here because this is a a breaker. This is a 250 amp breaker. Could have probably got a smaller one, but that was the one I first saw. And so we're going to have another lug that's going to go over to here. And then, um, and this is either way for the in and the out. It's going to then go out. And um, if there's some kind of a short or something, this circuit breaker will trip. I'll have to take the top off. Wonder what the heck happened if I've got a short somewhere down the line. Um, and if you've got a short, with this kind of cable, there may be some sparks flying for a moment. So I hope that breaker trips quickly. That's another story. Anyway, coming out of it, I'm going to be going over this way, kind of coming up under here, have this in place, and then I'm going to go into the next device. What's the next device? This little fella right here. This is a um, on-off switch for 12 volts. So rather than just taking the power cable and hooking it right up and getting a big arc like your arc welding, <laughs> hopefully you've got safety glasses on, uh, it's better to have it where you go through a on-off switch which controls the 12 volts so that it turns it on in a nice safe way. So it has a two position switch. This is the on position. If it goes the other way, in fact it's on, you see the little green there. And when it goes in the other position it shows red which means it's off. So at any rate, it'll go through there, and then I'll be going to the 12 volts. I'll hook up a ground somewhere. Could maybe even come back here. I've got another cable like this one, a black one, that I could hook up to the ground there, or just pick up a ground somewhere, as long as it's got enough current that it will take, um, then that would be fine. So at any rate, that's what my story is, and I'm sticking to it, so we'll see what happens. But um, pray for me. We'll hope everything goes well, and uh, I'll keep you informed as we're going through this. Of course, one of the big things that's going to have to do is the crimping of those cables. You want to have a good connection. You don't want to have kind of an okay connection, and then where it gets hot, because it doesn't have a lot of current going through the whole wire. So rather than going through... All of this, if you have a loose connection, it's maybe going through just a little bit of it, and then it's going to get hot, and um, that is not a good thing to have when you're working with voltage. So um, that, and also making sure that as I'm going through here, that there's nothing where this insulation is going to be um, severed by something that touches ground. That would be a bad thing. The circuit breaker would activate, but still, you don't ever want that to happen. So we want to protect our power cable as much as possible. That's one of the things I like about going through here rather than under the RV because I can have a full length is only going to be about um, maybe about one to two feet. Well, okay, I got some of the tools on the table here. Let's see what we got. Remember, we have our inverter and ultimately we're going to be connecting to the positive terminal first. We could do the negative if you wanted, but the, all the action is on the positive terminal, 12 volts DC. And we're going to have a um, connector that's going to go onto that. I've got some um, shrink wrap insulation that's going to go on this. I'm going to use a heat gun. I guess you could use a flame or something if you want to do also. But to shrink onto that so that you um, are covering the 12 volts so you don't be known as sparky. You people who have been there before, you know what I mean. And um, okay, so. Here's our 12 volts DC. Red is usually positive. That's what we're going to go with the convention. Just in case somebody buys an RV after me, you want to be sure that they're not confused on what's going on. And I think for around $30, I got a affordable um, crimper and cutter. We'll see how well that works. Now, I'm not going to have to cut this first one because it, it's pretty good cut. Not perfect. Might end up better than mine. We'll see as I get using the tool. But um, I'll be cutting after I get the first segment. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be putting on one of these connectors, slide in over so I have to peel back the insulation. And um, as I look at it, at least for this 
four aught cable connector. It's about mm, three quarters to seven inches. I'm going to go for three quarters insulation. So I've got a DeWalt um, cutting tool here, and um, I tell you, to try to get the blades to be put on, they have a half dozen blades on the handle, and to put one in, I had to find a YouTube video. The instructions just didn't give me enough information, but you have to have it fully out there. Push the button on the side, and then it will release, but if you don't have it fully pushed out all the way, this won't work, uh, and you won't be able to get it in position. So, okay, so um, we're ready to go, and we're going to do some cutting. So remember we said we wanted about three quarters of an inch, thereabouts, and um, some of the cable is already exposed, so I'm going to do just a little bit less than that, and we'll see how we do here. Now, um, there are tools also to do this. I didn't um, buy one of the tools, but um, there are tools that are there for doing cutting. Did I order one? I thought maybe I did. No, maybe I didn't. I thought I would just use this approach is just using a sharp knife. Um, and, you know, I guess I do have a, a nice pocket knife, but I think for something like this, you'd really just as soon use a, um, a razor blade knife. Obviously, you want to be very careful with the safety aspects on it. And um, you don't want to cut too deep there because you start knocking off some of the copper wires. But if you lose a couple of them, um, that's okay. You want it, though, where you don't end up where you um, are missing too much of it. Okay, so let's go ahead and see where we're at here. And there we go. Now, when it comes to like electronics, I've worked in electronics in my career, and um, you have to tin the wire. That is, you take some um, a heat source like a soldering iron, and then put the solder on it, and it will absorb it and make a um, a nice electrical connection as well as a solid mechanical without the wires going every which way. But on this, no, we're not going to be soldering. That's not part of the operation. So you want to get it to be going as straight as possible and as tight as possible because obviously if it fans out it's not going to get a good start so let's see what happens here you're probably going to lose a couple of these that are not going to go in all the way by jove i think we've done it well i've got maybe two that came out i can definitely handle that although we do want to break them off don't we we don't want 12 volts to be out there on the outside of the cable that we don't see okay I think I like it. So now it's time to do the crimping, says there in fine print. Um, now on this there is a different settings where you can twirl these in. I don't know if you can see that, but it should say number four at the top. So this is a four aught cable. So we're going to open it up. Boy, that doesn't look near enough. Hmm. I think this is maybe four gauge, not four aught as I'm looking at it here. Uh oh. Well, I'm going to use the biggest opening. That's all I can do. And, um, hmm. Nothing like having the wrong tool for the job. I thought I was getting something that was 4 aught, and I think it's 4, which is a whole different arrangement. And um, will that go in there? Jeez, it won't. <sighs> Mama said there would be days like this, so I'm going to take a look and see what I can do. Stay tuned. Okay, I think I have a solution, but this is the way life is. Sometimes we have to resort to field expediency. Yeah, it turns out as I look at the numbers on these, the biggest is one ought, not four ought, as opposed to, yeah, it had number four, but I somehow the way it had like two, four, six, eight, one ought, I assume the others were oughts also. So, um, yeah, I could try as I may, you know, can I slide it in if I can't go to on the other way? And no, it's not going to be big enough. So um, I hope Amazon is okay with me returning this. I'm not really going to use the tool at all. Um, I would like to use the cutter, though. The cutter looks like it's going to fit just fine. Uh, is that ethical to use it for cutting and then returning it? I think it's not going to hurt it at all. Well, I'll have to cope with that. But um, at any rate, the way I'm going to crimp it, I'm sure some of you have done this before. I'm going to use another crimping tool. I'm going to use a set of um, channel locks and I'm going to squeeze it around at various angles and uh, maybe I can get one channel lock this way and another the other way and um, 
that's what we're going to try doing. So stay tuned. We'll see how it turns out. Okay, here's the deal. We have done some crimping. I've got, um, you know, putting it down on the cement and putting my foot on the top of it. It seems like it's holding pretty good, but I can see it's... Um, not perfect. It's a little bit oblong on one side. I didn't get that good hex like I can't use the tool. So I've got some solder. You know, I think I've had this back well. This is 6040 and this is number 44 resin in it um, and core 66 diameter 0 0.093 inches. So, okay, um, we're going to use that. And um, to get a fair amount of heat, I'm, I'm on a metal surface here. Um, we're going to go ahead and use a propane burner. And let's see what we've got coming up. Safety glasses are checked. I think I got a little bit too much heat here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So I do believe I have an attachment for this. I'm going to try that and see if I can control that heat a little bit. Okay, I've got a um, soldering tip on the end. Go figure. Why didn't I use that before? So let's go ahead and see if we can get that to um, heat up. We're going to put some heat on the uh, soldering iron. They call this tinning operation. It's going to take a little while maybe before it gets hot enough. There we go. Starting to melt. Get a good heat transfer. It's going to take a while because there's a lot of copper. So there's going to be a fair amount of heat transfer going to that big copper wire. It's starting to flow. putting quite a bit of pressure with my right arm here holding this on. Well, okay, that may not be the best solder joint I've ever done, but um Wow, the cable's a little hot all the way down here. I'm gonna grab it a little further. I'm down one foot on the cable and the heat is like really coming down here. But you know, I think that um, I've done a fairly good job on that side and uh, so the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. At least one of the things I wanna do is, is yank it apart. If it yanks apart, then um, it's probably not gonna be good enough to use. So um, I'm gonna let that cool off a little bit. Um, and we'll see if we're ready to go ahead and start working on the other side. A little slower this way, not having a crimping tool, but sometimes without spending, oh geez, I imagine it's going to be a hundred dollars to get a aught or four aught cable um, crimper, but uh, we'll see if that works for us. Stay tuned. Well, okay, next step. Yeah, it looks like it held in there. I, you know, put a um, channel lock in there and like a pliers and tried to grip it, move it around, and it seemed like it was holding. So next step is to put a sleeve over it. And um, so I've got a heat insulated sleeve and I'm gonna put it as close as I can to the terminal there. So I don't want to have any chance of electricity getting to any of it except to the spot where it's making a connection. Now I could use the propane tank and keep a long ways away, but no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go ahead and I do have a heat gun here, so um, we'll go ahead and crank it on up and get this shrink wrap tubing and start to shrink it on up in position. There it goes. It's sucking right on it. Looks nice and tight. Obviously you don't want to get too much to where some of the copper wire is going to pop through. Good. Okay. There we go. So the idea is you want a good electrical connection. You want it to be where there's a minimum chance of the 12 volts touching something else which could get grounded. And yet you need to have enough there where you can get to the um, 
circuit. Remember the first one I'm going to do is to the battery itself. So once I get it hooked up to the battery, uh, then I'm going to go into my next circuit, which is going to be to the uh, circuit breaker. You might want to use a fuse in your case. That's fine. You'll have to replace it if it blows. Um, and obviously it has, it'll probably blow a lot quicker than a circuit breaker. So next, uh, maybe in about, um, in this case, I think it was about six inches to a foot. And then we're going to go into this circuit here. We're going to go in on one, out on the other. And then we're going to have maybe about one foot and then we're going to get into the switch two position switch one off one on and um, it has terminals on the bottom there's little pop-offs that can come off i can either come both sides or one on in and out on the other we'll take a look at that and then we'll go to the inverter over here so okay i won't bore you with all of the basic rudimentary <laughs> kind of Farmer Joe crimping operation, whatever you'd want to call it. Um, but I'll go ahead and do the crimping, the soldering, and we'll go ahead and um, see how we come along with that. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going to use a cutting tool and go about at 8 inches, I think, for our first cut. Just right at that mark. And let's see how this works. Wow. That did a wonderful job. That looks really good. Do you see that? That is so much better than that first one I had there. Those connectors are really tight. So I'm not sure what they used to cut on the end when they prepared this cable and sent it to me, but um, you can see if you have a good cutting tool, it does a marvelous job in the end. So that's um, a big plus. Okay. Well, okay, we're making good progress and let's talk about lessons learned. Um, boy, where to start? So much. Um, well, okay, first off, we're gonna be going from the battery to the circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker, you know, I was reading online and uh, one of the responses were on Amazon reviews is that um, it doesn't matter which way it faces. And I believed it, but then I got looking at this closer and one side says line and the other side says load. Now I asked myself, why would you put it there unless it mattered? So I'm not sure what circuit is in here, but I'm going to trust the fact that it does make a difference. And the line means towards your power source, towards the battery, towards that battery terminal post. And the load means, in this case, going into the inverter and then ultimately going to all the things you hook it up to. So I'm gonna have the load is gonna be going side, it's gonna be going out. So um, I've got um, one lug here. I'm gonna add another lug right here. The last lug for the hot system, the power. And then over on this side, it's done. So we've got um, one is going into the control switch, the on-off switch. You don't want to just hook up hot power to it. If you do, adjust for minimum sparks because it might be some sparks that are going to fly. Anyway, going out of that and then going into the actual input to the inverter. And I've got a little bit of gaffer's tape I put over there to kind of make a nice turn and hold it in place. And um, what else can I say? Quite a few things. One is the techniques on how to uh, hook these up. So these lugs, you know, uh, you'd really want to have, in my case, a knot four wrench. And as I mentioned before, is that I do not have a knot four. It goes only up to knot one. You know, um, I don't think I'm gonna turn it back in. Um, I do like the cutter, and maybe there'll be another application before, but an Ot4 tool, I imagine, is probably a couple hundred dollars, so no, I'm not gonna buy one of those. I'm gonna use Plan B. But the cutter, I really like the cutter. I can use it for all kinds of projects I can see, so it's worked out really nice to make Nike sharp. And in fact, this one here is, um, yeah, another one done by the factory, and I don't really care for it. So let's go ahead and get a nice sharp edge here. I had to measure it right, so I don't want to take off too much. And because it's short, I had a lot of little pieces fly rather than have the, uh, a big piece of cable. But 
as you can see now I've got a nice smooth edge there so anyway I really like the cutting tool I would recommend if you could all afford to get one of those I'm sure that they're pretty cheap because uh, most of the cost of that $30 I got for the grimping tool they threw this in so great I like it okay so I'm gonna take um, you know I, I think I mentioned about three quarters to seven inch uh, I'm gonna find that I'm gonna put a full one inch because I need to put some solder in yeah, I'm not going with the, the crimping method. I tried a couple different ways, but I thought, you know, um, I think that I'm gonna just have a little extra room. I'm gonna run some solder in there. Now I have a 60-40. Um, um, when I'm working with electronics, it's 63-47. That's the ratio between tin and lead. And um, in this case, I guess that, um, you know, I'm gonna be okay with a 60-40. You know, I think I got it in college. I was about 20, almost 70. A sucker's old. You think it's still gonna work? Well, I hope I'm still gonna work. So, at any rate, it seems like it's good. It does have a, um, it's called 44 um, resin flux. So you wanna have a resin flux. If you don't, if you just got solid solder, you don't have a core, or and while I'm working with electronics, it's a multi-core. But if you're just using for something like this type of a, Oh, just running electricity, not electronics. Um, yeah, just use a, a rosin core or a paste rosin. You can go ahead and do it if you don't want to have it in the core of the solder, but um, I think it's kind of preferred. So, okay, we've got that off. And as I think as I mentioned before, is that um, you get a nice cut on it and it's a lot easier to go ahead and fit your lug on it. So I'm gonna take the copper lug and you can see it just slides right on. Now, before you crimp it and solder it and everything in place, make sure that you get it at the right angle that you want. Now, in my case, I'm gonna be going, as you recall, to the breaker, and it's flat, and then I'm gonna go from the breaker and the battery. So I'm gonna make it on the same plane as what we've got over here. So I'm not gonna put it sideways or anything like that. You can get a certain amount of bend to these if you need to, and I did do when I was coming out of the um, inverter. You can see I've got a little bit of a bend there to it. I'm not going to try too much. Don't want to fatigue it, but um, that's one thing to consider. I'll go ahead and fire up the propane burner here in just a second. That's going to be my little workspace right there on the end of uh, something that's not too valuable a tool, such as an old hammer. Oh, by the way, I got thinking about, um, yeah, there's grounding and there's the neutral and you know if you have a bigger system you only want to have one spot in the whole system where you tie together the neutral and the ground so I got thinking how is this one hooked up because this is smaller just for you know smaller appliances not going to a multiple system where you've got um, a lot of different types of um, inputs coming like the solar and other things and it says at any rate for the grounding the power inverter has a terminal on the rear side of the panel marked ground, or it's got a ground symbol, which is a big line, and they get smaller as it goes down. And I see it's right over here on this side. It's got that kind of a gold looking thing. So anyway, that's where we're gonna hook the ground to. We're gonna just hook it to the chassis somewhere. If you have a bigger system, um, your mileage may vary. So, you know, be careful when it comes to doing the grounding. Just don't assume that um, the neutral and the ground get tied there and then somewhere else, you know, it's got another neutral and ground connection and um, something blows up and it actually can destroy the inverter too. So yeah, just be careful with that if you have another system. In this one, it just has um, no neutral ground that you have to think about. The neutral's all inside, the ground just goes to the ground. So okay, I'm getting ready to do the solder and the way I found to do it is, um, well, I'll show you. First, I'm gonna crimp it. So um, I've got actually a piece of solder that I'm gonna slip in the connector here. So okay, it's gonna go in like there, and I'm gonna put a little piece of solder to go right in there with it, and slip it right in the tool. And I think I can get another one on the other side. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a piece, and well, maybe be just as easy to cut it. And I'm gonna come in on the other side and see if I can get a little bit more solder in there on that side. Yep, well, I thought I had it going there. There she goes. Slip it all the way in. Okay, I'm gonna slide that in as far as it'll go, and it looks like it 
remember I had it to about one inch and for a four gauge that looks like that's going to just about do it and that's going to go like that so now I'm going to crimp and uh, I found the best way if I can find my <laughs> tool I'm using a channel ox so I'm taking the channel ox I'm going to hold it on as far as I can I'm going to squeeze it while holding it in place and it looks like I'm going to have to loosen it up quite a bit here for the first one. And um, just hold it in place and give it a little crimp. Get some leverage. Okay. But rather than going back and forth, I've just found that it's easier for me if I just have it where I just do it in a flat orientation and have it squished all the way across. Okay, I got the front. A little bit more on the back. Holding it in place. Okay, once more in the front. You kind of get the idea. I'm just kind of making it like a pancake and I can get more pressure that way. Ah. Okay, maybe one more on the other side. It's getting pretty flat. Oh yeah, we can maybe get another. At this point, I should have pretty good connection. Oh, oh that's the last one. Can I get it apart? Okay, ouch. <laughs> okay, I've got it in there pretty good. And you know, I guess that's um, what it, it's gonna work for me. So now I'm gonna go ahead and get the um, propane. And you don't wanna have it upside down. You wanna have it so that that's going this way when it comes out, and um, that way it won't have a blowout. And let's go ahead and get some more solder in. Now I'm gonna be putting the heat on the lug. And I'm gonna let the lug get hot. And you'll see the solder that I put on there. It's going to start melting a little bit. See, I don't know if you can see it, but it's starting to vaporize. It's getting hot. And now I'm just going to be adding more solder. It's starting to flow. Now it's really starting to suck it in. A little bit of the insulation is getting hot, but that's okay. You know, if it was electronics, you worry about cold solder joints. I do not think I'm going to have a cold solder joint here. So um, it's going to be pretty hot, needless to say. In fact, um, I've got a piece of insulation that I pre-cut. I'm making them about, oh, two or three inches. And, um, you know, I find that um, when you put that slided on, you just about don't even hardly need to use the shrink wrap. It's still quite hot. But in this case, maybe a little bit. I do see I've got a little bit of um, extra solder that's splashed there, and so I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can get that ugliness out of the way because it's got um, sharp tips to it there, and you don't want that to be going through the insulation. And if you need be, you can go ahead and get a file if it's got some sharp edges. You know, I think I will get a file. Bastard. Bastard file, that is. You know that, don't you? <laughs> One that's um, got a really big cross grip on it. Oh, incidentally, when you're working with electronics, don't let um, solder specs and things get into your inverter. You know, it's this one is very well sealed, I can see, but it's just kind of a good cleanliness practice is don't go getting a lot of debris little small metal pieces. Remember I've got these hundreds of little pieces of copper from when I clipped the edge of it there so keep that stuff away from the inverter. Okay I think that does it and um, well you know this actually the end of where I did the crimping I can see it's got a little sharpness just from the bending the metal on the copper. Hey I'm losing copper!
<laughs> Can I reclaim it? Well, not quite like gold, but um, okay, I think that's pretty good. And you can see that baby is not going to come off. So I've got a good electrical connection. So on goes the sleeve and I like to take it to where it covers most of the metal. Get the heat gun or whatever you're using to go ahead and get shrink wrap to work. Starting to grab a hold of it. Okay, it's tight on that side. Let's see what we can do down here. Up, oh, that goes quick. And voila! Put it somewhere, make sure you don't catch anything afire. And um, that's it. So I, we've got a good connection on it there and we're ready to go ahead and hook it up to our circuit breaker. Where is that? Over here. Circuit breaker is right there, goes in, lug nut on the top, and when we get this thing all put together, we're going to uh, be ready to hook it up. Now, um, it's generally not a good idea to be hooking up electronics with the power still connected to it, so um, we'll go ahead and use some precautions and make sure there, but I'm at this time going to turn the transfer switch off so that I'm not going to want to have power going to the inverter or to the ground until such thing as I get everything in place. But I'm going to be very careful working with the circuit now because I've got, um, once I hook this to the battery, it's going to be there to the uh, breaker as well as to the uh, shutoff switch. Epilogue, Stardate's Captain's Log, July 2019. <laughs> well, um, okay, how did it go? I think generally everything's going pretty well. Uh, I do have the inverter installed. I'll show you the way it looks and its finished product in just a minute. And um, reflections. Well, it's a 2K inverter, and I think that, you know, I'm not going to try using it all the way up to 2K, but this power cable I've got, that was way too big. You know, I'm not going to be pulling 200 amps through this thing. Yeah. Um, even if it was, I don't think I need four aught cables, so could have done a smaller one. And it kind of makes you feel a little silly when you take a look at the rest of the cables that are going to uh, the hookup I hooked up at the battery on mine. And you look at the negative, and it's as big around as my little finger. And um, everything else that's there is one-fourth that size or smaller. Um, but at any rate, I think it's always good to over-engineer, so um, so be it. Um, these um, lugs um, definitely worked well with the cable, except I didn't have the crimping tool, and um, I did see on Amazon where you can get them as low as $50. I'm sure the good ones, if you're commercial, you want to pay a couple hundred dollars. Um, in my case, I just got the channel locks, and I just uh, put in as far as I could, squeeze, 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 on the inside and on the outside, squeeze, 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 so it made it flatter. And I thought, you know, um, I'm gonna then add solder. So I used got some 6040 solder with resin core, or you could paste the resin on, um, get a good flow, um, used a propane burner. Don't put it on the solder. You wanna get it actually on the metal, get the metal up to um, the melting point. Um, let the solder get flowed in there, and it's, I think, gonna make a good electrical connection. Um, there is a ground wire that they want you to put on, and the ground water, wire is not holding a lot of current, so I just got, you know, something that I use for, oh, I don't know, it's probably 16 or 18 gauge or something like that. It's just to make sure that there are no shocking hazards, um, no current that's going through the ground leg. And what else? So I really like this cutting tool. Uh, I don't know what gauge you're going to use, but um, this cutting tool is the way to go. I would not use a, um, a hacksaw or another thing. This gives a nice, smooth, great cut on it, and it's worth having a good cutting tool, I believe. Um, your insulation, be sure you get something that you cover your positive. Negative, not quite so much, but the um, heat shrink tubing, uh, pretty cheap. I can get something like this, I don't know, it's four feet or more, more than you're going to need for your project, and um, slip it over the cable, use your heat gun or um, whatever, cigarette lighter, something to go ahead and get some heat, and it'll um, get close to it, and it shrinks up, and make sure that uh, it keeps the 
voltage away from that 12 volts, especially when you're talking about 100 amps or more. That could create quite a spark and hopefully not a fire. Okay, I think that's some of the major items. Oh, there was one more, <laughs> not a little item. When I got everything hooked up, I turned it on. That is the breaker that goes into it. Remember, I have like going through initially a fuse from the battery, a circuit breaker that is. And then after that, it goes to a on off switch so that uh, I can go ahead and have the power off as I do the electrical connections and then just turn on the main um, bypass switch to an on position and um, everything starts to charge up. Um, I turn it on, nothing happened. <laughs> I was like, what's up? I looked down the front, I don't see any buttons or anything like that. I'm expecting something the size of a dime or a quarter, or some kind of rectangular button or something to turn it on. Could not get it to go. So I went back, did I have voltage at the breaker? Yes, at the input and the output, yes. Did I have voltage at my uh, bypass switch? Yes, at the input and the output. Did I have voltage at the inverter input? Yes, I have 12 volts, I have a good ground, yes. Well, what's up with that? Well, looking at the manual, when all else fails, read the fine manual. G, using the inverter. Check the output voltage, the capacity of the battery, yada, 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 yeah, it's gonna be 12, 13 volts, and connect your inverter to your battery. Um, be careful you do not reverse, yada, 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 yeah, okay, sure. Connect your inverter to the battery source, yeah, we talked about that one, three. Press the power switch. What? <laughs> I looked on the front and I didn't see the power switch. Now it's down by my ankle height. I raised it up a, a bit and I didn't see anything. I saw where there's this little white speck where you hook the ground, a symbol for the ground. I did not see the power button. It's about the size of a, oh, less than an eraser head, something like that on a pencil. Press the power switch button on your inverter for five seconds and the green LED light will light up indicating that the inverter was on. Well, there you go. I didn't realize it had an on switch. I, I guess it should have. I just assumed you had the bypass switch at the input is where you turned it on, but it does make sense. And they do recommend that um, be sure that all the devices that you have hooked up to the inverter are turned off before you turn the inverter on. I think one exception might be if you have something with a, um, a slow start. Um, now, I'm not gonna be hooking it up to something like a, well, like an air conditioner unit or something like that. But um, generally, you know, be sure your devices are turned off, they're hooked up to the inverter. Push the button on the on for the inverter. Once you've done that, then you go ahead and hook your other devices and have them turned on. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Let's go take a look and see the way the installation looks. Okay, in the sprinter, um, right underneath the um, driver's side is, is where there is a cover that goes over the battery and then the carpeting goes over that. And um, this is the positive here. So um, there's the hookups that went to the um, cab before and going off to the coach and um, the other power circuits. And so I went ahead and put one of the lugs over on this one, took off the existing um, nut there, put the lug on there. Um, and here you can see my heat shrink wrap that goes over here on this one. And the first thing I go through and I have it down in the battery compartment is the 250 amp um, circuit breaker. That little yellow button over on the side is to reset it probably would have wanted maybe about 200 amps. It's a little high um, considering two kilowatts. It should only be drawing maximum about um, oh, 180 to 200 amps. But um, okay, at any rate, that's what I've got there coming out of it. More shrink wrap going on. And I could have had a little bit more shrink wrap to go closer, but you know, um, I guess that um, I got a little short changed on that. I could put some tape over that perhaps. Going out the cable, and then as we go over the plate, we're coming out now, and I had to make a little improvisation. I'll show you that in a little bit. But this is where I was talking about the um, breaker, so when I want to turn it in the on position, I'll flip it over here. You can see I'm starting to turn it that way, and you can see the green is starting to go on there. I'm not gonna turn it on now, although it's not hooked anyway. But at um, any rate, that's gonna be the on-off bypass switch. And on the other side is the ground over here. So one half of it has got the 
positive and you can see I've got gaffer's tape over it to make sure that nothing gets over there and bangs up and touches ground. The other side is a negative. I didn't cover that. It's well down behind. There are some fans here back by the way and you want to keep those so that they're always free so that um, when you're drawing a get up to a kilowatt or two kilowatts that you know you get some heat dissipation but you need some more there so and then it goes back into the negative and I had to where am I going to get a ground connection and I, I was looking under here this actually does not have ground connection this does but they're a little small I have that the um, small ground but the neutral I guess I should say I need to have somewhere for it to go so I had to go right to the battery and I got um, something where I could um, come off the existing battery post and go to a secondary and get to my, you know, several hundred amp 4 aught cable. Hoo-ha! So, um, at any rate, once we put this back on, I'll show you a little bit about the way what I had to modify the cap there, because that took a little special work. So, um, here's where the cap goes for the battery box. And um, it used to go all the way around here, so I had to take a, um, a saw. I actually used a um, angle saw there and cut this out, then put some gaffer's tape on that so that it's not going to have a sharp edge. And then it goes right over here and in that spot and locks into position. These get screwed down. But here you can see where I, I took and I actually bent this up a little bit so that it's not going to be pushing. Now, so much worried on the negative, but the positive, yeah, you don't want to have anywhere where there's a lot of vibration and after a while it's going to be starting to cut through and man, that would short out quickly. Not a good thing. That's where having your circuit breaker as close as you can to the battery is a good thing. If I had the circuit breaker somewhere there and then there was some kind of a short out here, um, it's going to be just smoke and fire until the battery burns out or something happens. So, um, anyway, that's how that hooks. And I have one other thing to show you. And that is, how do we turn it on? <laughs> that was where I got kind of a little twisted up. So, I guess this is the front of it, and it's at least down a little bit low for me, but um, there's the two outlets, um, resets on the breakers for those. And here's where the ground is, um, gets hooked up. And right there, right above that little brown wire where my fingernail is, that's where the on-off button is, right there. That thing is the smallest on-off button I've seen in my life. Right there is where it is. So at any rate, I think they could have done a little better job at having a bigger one. I know that they had a limited amount of real estate, but that button is too small, in my opinion. But now that I know where it's at, I won't make that problem again. So um, I still have to mount this in position. And, you know, they've got some nice holes. They do have this lifted off the ground a little bit so that it um, is not going to be getting too hot on the ground. It has a little air circulation underneath it. And I might either put some screws in here, some sheet metal screws on the side, or I just might use some 3M, um, that heavy-duty Velcro tape. It's going to hold it in position. Either way is fine by me. So there you have it. Um, that's what it's all about. And um, it's kind of be nice to have um, a couple kilowatts maximum. I don't think I'll normally go more than a kilowatt. <laughs> the batteries for the bicycles, those are 100 watts. So that's not going to be a big power. Even if we charge up both batteries at the same time, that's only a couple hundred watts. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of batteries, as we talk about, um, for cameras and all the other things we have in the RV and in some of our devices. So I think it'll be nice when we're out on the road and the alternate is running to go ahead and get some free power. Well, it'll drag down, obviously, the engine just a little bit, but I don't think it'll be more than a mile or two per gallon that it's gonna affect it. So um, I'll let you know if I see something that's appreciable there. So I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, as always, look forward to your comments, likes, um, feedback, and um, how you've used your inverter. The idea on this was not to have something like a big Magnum or one that's a couple thousand dollars. And I'm not getting the solar at this point. Maybe later on, you know, I'll save those crimping cables and the lugs and everything and we'll see what happens. But that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed the show. And as always, happy trails to you until we meet again. Bye now. Have you been to California? Seen the sights and people there? Walked the streets of sleepy sea towns, tasted salty ocean air.